We can send people to the moon, but we can't tell you if you're in home <laughs> Meet Sarah Curran, a trailblazing entrepreneur, a chief menopause officer at Just Hotter. She's here to show you that overcoming addiction, battling self-hate and starting a new business isn't just for 30 under 30. It's called the silent killer of women over 40. Irrelevant, depressed, old. And then you feel invisible when 50 was still at the peak of our careers. I'm just like, blinkers on. Yeah. Don't talk to me about so it. Why <laughs> would you? It is so bad for some women. It has a way of hijacking you mentally. Whereas for a man, there's no age. There's no age to him. He just gets better with age. A woman. What was it like turning 50 for you? So I think it was... Very quickly, do you realize that you know me and I know nothing about you? Time to fix that. Whether you're listening when you're commuting, in between meetings or childcare, or drifting off to my voice, no offense taken, I'm curious. Are you a fellow book lover? Do you unwind by taking long walks? Do you watch here on YouTube or tune in on independent podcast platforms such as CastBox or Fountain Podcasts? Tell me everything. This Christmas, I'm giving away three of my top non-fiction books of 2023, and I'll also be sending a personalized postcard to three others. Die-hard fans, I'm looking at you. Want to win? Simply fill in the survey in the show notes, subscribe on YouTube, follow on Apple and Spotify, and leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Remember, I won't be able to let you know if you won if you haven't filled in the survey. Let's get to know each other. I'll be announcing the winner on Boxing Day, 26th of December, and I'm rooting for you. Sarah, welcome back. I was thinking about that this morning. I was like, oh, I'm going back. I love it. Oh. I like that your podcast is amazing. What you do is amazing. You and Felipe, great team. Thank you. Last time I saw you, you were a true fit. And now you have another business because yeah. nobody can stop you from having yeah. your own ideas <laughs> and like going for oh. it. And the business is just hotter. Yeah. So... I, there were a few things that happened this year and I'd been really interested in changes to my health and wellness um, for the past five years and predominantly since going into perimenopause. And then this year I turned 50 and I kind of did a bit of a, an, a re-evaluation of my life and where I was and what my future, if I'd continued on that path, would look like. And... I realized that I needed to find that happiness in me um, and find the fulfillment. And I, I, those moments are always attached to the launch of something new. And I think it's one of those things that as much as I, I have... I have, I've, I've managed my anxiety, so I have sort of anxiety issues. Um, I'm, a, I'm a natural hermit. I'm not, I'm not very good. I'm confident in business. I'm shy, personally. I'm a control freak. So one would, all these sort of various things, one would imagine that actually my worst fear would be startups. But it's where I feel the most in control. Isn't that weird? It is really weird. So talk me through that. Is that something that you've realized early on or is that something that has come to you and you thought, actually, where do I feel most at peace? It was, it's, it's something that I've realized later on, mm. more recently. Um, and I, I think it's because you're back into creating something new mm -hmm. and it's an it's a open, you know, it's a clear piece of paper and you can create whatever you want. And it always aligns to a, a bigger purpose for me and something that I'm really passionate about. And, um, and yeah, for me, the, my priority now for a 50-year-old is health, wellness and energy and knowing what serves me and what doesn't serve me, both sort of in what I consume, but also my thoughts. Um, and it's a great part of it, great sort of, moment in age because you understand yourself and you're more accepting um 
you stop sort of caring about the people pleasing elements and you realize that everyone inside is you know has their own issues so you know spending time trying to people please who themselves are also you know going through these personal sort of challenges just it's a really fascinating time mm. um and then i i just but i still can't get my head around you know the that sort of crossing over that boundary so talk to me about turning 50 mm. because at every stage and like every decade you know there are certain expectations both from society and yourself mm. and you know when I was turning 30, for example, everyone was like, oh my God, turning 30 is such a big deal. And I didn't, I didn't see it like that. I mm. never really saw it as this. I just thought, you know, entering 30s, great, fresh start. Then when I turned 40, so this was a year and a half ago, that was a very different experience. Like having had kids, running a business, figuring out your place in society mm. and all of a sudden like not, I guess not not feeling quite yourself for, for quite a while. And now I feel like I'm okay. I've like set myself up. And now the next decade is like, you know, I feel very positive and excited mm. about that. How was that for you? Like, what was it like turning 50 for you? So I think it was, um, it was a real melange of emotions. So there's naturally that, so my parents are, you know, getting older. So I've, I'm much more in France to support them. My son is 20 and he's starting his own career and it's amazing to watch. And, and you've, I pulled away from social events and my circle is really, really small. And I've always been a very judgmental of myself. And I think it was the sense of failure in, in certain things, failure in certain abilities of, you know, from a relationship perspective, um, failure in terms of that terrible thing we do where we compare ourselves to other people on the face value. Um, and, and that was a horrible place to be, really, you know, and then you feel invisible, you know, you're kind of like people, don't want to that they assume that once you get over a certain age you know you just kind of like it's fine you can yeah just just sit in the you know jog on kind of thing mm. um and and i'm not i'm still quite outspoken and i'm really it, when i started to research stats around the menopause i was so angry on behalf of so many women you know, two key questions that I asked. One was, how do you feel about the future? Um, and 76% said they felt from neutral to overwhelmed. Um, and 80% when asked, how does the word menopause make you feel? 80% said, um, came back with negative associated words such as um, irrelevant, you know, depressed, old and I'm like I know these women you know and they're still at the peak of their game and 50 you, you know is nothing mm -hmm. um and so it made me look at the landscape of of our and also comparisons culturally really really interesting but yeah I um I went down a lot of rabbit holes and then I came out with something positive because you know, I think it's about always finding the positive and trying to um, look at solutions mm. to problems. This episode is sponsored by HVO Search, a specialist executive search and talent advisory firm helping founders, CEOs and HR directors hire the most in-demand and best C-suite talent. Tired of seeing the same old CVs and uninspiring candidates? Reach out to me, Maria Vorostovsky, to find out how your business can skyrocket with the best talent. Going back to that pivotal moment of turning 50, was it associated with the menopause? What was going for you internally and then comparing that to what you were seeing externally? 
Yeah, I think a lot of it happens you don't even know. You know, there's a lot of changes that our bodies go through from a hormone perspective that naturally impact our psychology and how we feel and our moods. So that's one that's a one layer of it that we also have to to balance. But there is this, you know, you kind of have this the future and the future isn't just like endless anymore. I mean, you know, listen, I I'm not planning on going anywhere soon, but you know, you you tend to look at that this is what I still need to or want to achieve in my life. Whereas in your 30s and your 40s, it's so far away. Mm-hmm. And in a blink of a, you know, of a decade, I'm now, it freaks me out that I'm touching on, I'm closer to 60 <laughs> than I am to 40. You know, <laughs> that's just like, what? this is just so bizarre. Mm-hmm. And in my mind, I don't, you know, in my mind, I'm 43. Mm-hmm. I loved 43. Did you? Yeah. What did you love about it? I felt more confident in my abilities. Um, I, but I was still drinking at the time, so I was still kind of very much um, not helping myself mentally. But it was, it was a much more optimistic. Felt like I could, you know, I could achieve anything, and I can achieve anything at whatever age. And it's just, you know, how you, it's all all mindset. And I think I love nothing more than can you know taking control and understanding the psychology of why why mm. I'm glad that you're saying that 43 was your favorite age so now I'm 41 turning 42 next year when you go through difficult periods of time and you're experiencing some kind of like emotional discomfort what I have found is almost like you have to walk through that fire to get something at the end. So oh, yeah. when something breaks or you let go of something, mm. something else yeah. comes to fill its place, yeah. which is, fre- it's almost like the phoenix rising from the yeah. ashes where something new and fresh comes out of that. And that's how I feel. And the things that I feel like I'm leaving behind that get taken up in the flames is... Um, I don't know. I'm going to talk about the reason why I can't string my my words together later because it's related to our hormonal cycles. But what I'm leaving behind is caring so much about other people's opinions, which are not even other people's opinions. It's my opinions of other people's opinions Mm. and letting that go and having that freedom of being, you know what, connecting with my inner self Mm. much more and trusting myself Mm. much more that's the that's what I'm looking forward to more yeah and I wasn't like that in my 30s I definitely wasn't do you find that you are starting to release the need to people please or care what people yeah much more Mm. and it's extremely painful Mm. because I've been so living my life in such a way where doing things for other people and being nice and appearing pleasant just to appease that feels uncomfortable when you don't do it anymore. Yeah. Because you feel like somehow, oh, I'm a bitch. I'm, you know, not caring or, you know, what are they going to think of me? And it's very uncomfortable to not do that anymore but it's also very healthy. But what's interesting is you see how other people respond around you because Mm. they don't like it. Oh no, people do not like it when you change. Makes them very uncomfortable. When I stopped drinking, it made people extremely uncomfortable because they only knew the Sarah under the influence of liquid confidence. And now, I was great fun to be around with unless, you know, you're in my head and I'm terrible to myself, particularly the day after. As we get older, we start to feel more comfortable to put up boundaries of what we're prepared to accept and what we're not prepared to accept. Take Um, me back in time to the Sarah that was drinking. mm, Oh, my God. Terrible. Um, It was... Um, so I realized quite late on that I'm actually quite shy and 
going into a room where there's an expectation of from people um, and facing that without alcohol was overwhelmingly daunting and so and also because I'm naturally quite quiet and then with alcohol I sort of went you know from zero to a hundred but then I was it was also extremely self-destructive massively self-destructive mentally um and and I was never able to just have one drink so it led me down a really horrible horrible path of um a lot of self-hate um a lot of um self-judgment a lot of shame terrible shame and um shame around shame around the things that i would have done whilst drinking um nothing you know bad but things that i let myself down i let my um you know the inhibitions came down and yeah and just really it was very dark, extremely dark, and some terrible, really dark thoughts with alcohol. Um, I, you know, I was self-harming um, in those moments as well, because then it's not just the moment, it's, it happened, you know, it's, it's the days after. So it's that sort of, it's that anxiety kind of thing. And I realized I had a choice, I either, continued um and would get in a dark dark place or i could sort myself out focus on the priorities of life be it you know family and business and you know and move forward on on that this new path which is what i did and it has been it's been a huge learning experience because you get to understand yourself and you get to look at yourself through a really kind of um a, a sort of a lens of this is this is me you know there is no filter there's no mask of courage um this is it's raw and it's me and you know and it's it's quite liberating and i realized actually i i am a, you know i'm a good person i'm a kind person i care a lot but but it's also allowed me to enforce my boundaries of what I'm going to accept and no longer accept because you know we're all responsible for our actions but also how we what comes into you know our path. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, hugely so, learning. I mean, these these difficult times when you're faced with kind of like the harsh realities is when we have a choice, right, to mm. either continue and you know continue the self-destructive pattern totally or to say actually this is a really dark place to be and i don't want to be here anymore mm. what what got you out of it then um i used to do a lot of reading books around personality reading books around uh, sort of spirituality I think that was a really important thing for me, the realising of um, where we where we are and what we are there to contribute and all these sorts of things. And um and and I'm not it, it's also one of those things where you realise that for so long you've played the victim and you have to stop, reflect on that. And every, you know, every sort of moment is, is it's a new test. And you're like, okay, you've kind of called yourself out for this behavior. And so when you catch yourself kind of going back into that victim mentality and protest, you then have to stop. And it's, it's, but it's been, it's fascinating mm -hmm. because then you can spot someone else like mm -hmm. straight away. And I love to observe. I love to watch people that we were saying, at the beginning, you know, it's always, I think words are one thing, you know, you can kind of distract, but then you just watch people's actions and 
um, that is is what I find really really interesting. Um, but also, I wasn't going to just not move on to something better and find a new path, the new direction. And I'm a, I learned that I'm a fighter. You know, I'm absolute. I will not. Um, I'll not quit. And yeah. So I found out some amazing things about myself and found out some real weaknesses and then you address the weaknesses mm -hmm. and you fix them and you don't wallow in them and, you know, you don't blame anyone else. You know, I all my mistakes have been very much at my own hands and no one else's. It's hard, though, to really look at yourself in the mirror and to see yourself the way you are. Um, but it's harder to pretend it's harder to continue to do something so destructive that you actually can't, you just, just, you just feel terrible about yourself because you just feel worthless about yourself. That's mm. worse. Mm. Is That's, that how you felt? Oh my God, totally, mm. totally. Um, yeah, totally. Where did that come from for you, do you think? It was years and years of people pleasing and pretending to be or feeling I had to be a certain way in order to be accepted. And I think I, so I'm half French, half English. I never really felt like I fit in and listen, you know, I'm not, it's, this is not a kind of like Crimea River kind of thing because I know I'm extremely lucky compared to a lot of other people around the world. Um, but then, you know, how we feel about ourselves can be a very dangerous place as well. And, and yeah, and I think it was, I just never really felt like I fitted in. I was always, you know, I was always getting into trouble at school. And I think that was part of the pretending to fit in and you know doing stuff and and then discovery of alcohol at a really young age and how old um I think probably you know from 14 15 and then you know quite sort of a lot and the irony you know as they say that French you know society you know you give your children sort of water white red wine and water and my grandfather did that and you know from a really young age and yet I was completely a total wild child I was feral I would climb out of the bedroom window I would know which step you know which path part, part of the path to take so it'd make the least amount of noise on the you know on the drive um yeah, I was a total wild child. I would have been an absolute... I'm blessed with Jake, my son, who is, you know, he's just... Thank God. I I, I feel guilty for my parents of the terrible... Mm. Oh, my God. Terrible stuff I got up to at school. Yeah. Um, hilarious for other people, of course. Unless you're, you know... Unless you're Do you yourself. think that played into almost acting out even more when you get... I don't know, attention or laughs or... Yeah, probably. Or it's more that you think that that's the only way that someone's going to like you. And so being the people pleaser then, you very quickly kind of make that call of, you know, that calculation of what, who do I need to be to be, you know, and it's a bit like a chameleon, you know, you sort of, you can be all, all different things to all people different sorts of people um and and it was an age thing that uh that allows you to sort of start to uncover that mm. which is which is a great thing but it's also a very painful thing it must be exhausting also because if you're people pleasing mm. then you also have to understand what each individual may find pleasing mm. which means that there isn't only one way of doing that yeah, so you're totally. adjusting to yeah. so many different totally. people yeah yeah but I think we pull on various masks and we value someone else's feelings 
more importantly than our own. Each time you're telling yourself that your own feelings just aren't valid enough in comparison. And we have it as with, you know, when we when we become mothers, there's that thing where we feel that taking time for ourselves to go and exercise or, or doing so, we feel guilty. And again, it's one of those things where you sh- one shouldn't feel guilty about prioritising time for ourselves, which is actually important, assuming it's not something destruct- destructive. And it's a dance on both sides because I've learnt to respect other people's boundaries. And in return, I expect others to respect mine. You've got to, and you have to have more honest conversations and get comfortable with having uncomfortable conversations. And I love an uncomfortable conversation. So, and it's part of just evolving as a human and getting more comfortable with our ugly parts. It's part of the, the prolonged inevitability every time you use a filter on Instagram but at some point you're going to have to look at yourself without that filter just get comfortable with just being you and being enough and when I say enough I don't mean like not look for continued self-progression and all these sorts of things but again it's that people pleasing and it's it's a an additional weight so once you get rid of that once you get rid of that monkey off your back Mm -hmm. it is kind of liberating it frees you up to do a lot more and actually you can be more comfortable being more outspoken about things it is really interesting when you start to understand yourself you start to understand your triggers and also start to understand what the triggers can lead to in in terms of certain sort of destructive behaviours, be it thoughts or be it emotionally eating or drinking. So you've got to do a kind of an audit and realise what you need out of a day in order to get the best out of your achievement. I know for my mental health, going out for a run every day, if I don't do it, I can, I can start to just be in my head too much. Whereas being outside, that change of energy and that fresh air, our mind is so powerful. It has the ability to make us feel amazing or make us feel terrible within the same day. Because you've got two young kids. Yeah. And you see everything that's happening in the world you've got your own personal lessons as well and things that you ambitions and goals and dreams you have for your kids how do you look at your four and five-year-old children Mm -hmm. and think you know the future ahead of them Mm -hmm. and all the things or the risks that you know that are out there don't you find it (laughs) i mean when they were younger especially when they were very small, I had a huge amount of anxiety, mm. like huge. I couldn't, when you're talking about, can't even, couldn't even go to a yoga class because in my mind I was thinking I'm leaving. I had huge separation anxiety. Mm. I was like, are they going to be okay? If someone's going to call me. And I would have these crazy intrusive thoughts of the most elaborately awful things that can happen. Mm. And I had to really work on that because it was impacting not just my own mental state, but it was impacting everything like my work or having, you know, all of that Mm. going on. So I, I'm less so in that place now because they are, they're bigger. Mm. I don't feel like it's as anxiety inducing because they I'm more self-sufficient now, but also I've been working on my mental state. So when you ask me a question about, you know, do I think about their future? If I think really far ahead, like I get really terrified and I start imagining really worst case scenarios again. And what if I'm not there? And, you know, what are they going to do? But I bring myself back to the things that I just know in my heart, deep down, what are the most important things that I want to teach my kids? And it is emotional intelligence. Mm. It's about connection. It's about being a decent human being Mm. and having deep self-respect for yourself 
and having respect for other people around you mm. and knowing that no matter what you do, you are safe in my presence. I'm not always a safe place for my kids. I have my moments. I have my child tantrums as well. But I think it's it's a journey. I don't think any parent is a perfect, mm. any human being is not perfect. So there are things that the kids teach you more so than maybe you teach them. But I just know in my heart of hearts that if I can teach my kids that they are emotionally safe mm. with me, then it actually doesn't really matter about anything else. Like, can they read? They will read eventually. Yeah. You know, can they do maths? Well, some will be good, some will be less good. Yeah. You know, um, can they, I don't know, run really quickly? Okay, you know, everyone will have their own traits, every skill, and they will be different. And what I imagine them to be, they may have a completely different idea. So I think it's about instilling that sense of self, of learning to trust yourself is really important. I think that's what I'm trying to give myself, mm. but also then to give to my kids. Because I think that's a really fascinating part of the changes that we also have to go through as we're getting older, but we want to help bring well-rounded humans into this world. I learned so much from Jake and sometimes I learn more about myself through his eyes. It's another complexity that we go through on top of our career, on top of mental health. Um, and then we've got everything that's, you know, in the geopolitical landscape that's happening. It's, it's just a really complex time. Mm -hmm. um, I did a lot of work with various therapists and spiritual healers and about understanding the shadow self and the shadow self is that really destructive, dangerous sort of part. And allowing, accepting that part and not pretending that part doesn't exist in you because it, it exists in all of us, you know, whatever it might be. For me, it's one thing, for you, it'll be something else. And, um, and I, I think as human beings, we are so intolerant of other people's opinions if they differ to our own um we expect so much to be just done for us that we forget to do stuff for ourselves um and we want so much and some people don't care who they take from just to own it and have it and that's a really ugly place to for society to be in. I think that comes from an inability to sit with your own uncomfortable emotions. Mm. Because, and I say that, not as a person who has mastered their emotions, like I feel like I've so much work, but what I have noticed in myself is when I see someone having an emotional moment or if I'm speaking with them and they're distressed, my natural instinct in the past would be like, how can I relieve them of the stress? And yes, it's compassion, but it's also because they're making me feel uncomfortable. uncomfortable. And so whilst I'm trying to help them, it's also trying to calm myself down. Yeah. And the way that I have learned how to do that is by doing things for other people, as opposed to just sitting there with that emotional discomfort mm. and saying, and holding space holding space for another person mm. to explore their own emotions. And I'm learning that through kids because they trigger me like nobody else. Yeah. And I'm learning that through this podcast as well, because having to sit and listen, I mean, you know, a lot of it is about business, so it's not always as emotional or as, you know, deeply connected as, as this one is, but allowing to just listen mm. And to be in that space to feel what the other person is feeling is very mm. hard. Which goes to getting comfortable with uncomfortable conversations or situations mm -hmm. and allowing that person to express themselves, which might make you uncomfortable or might make you uncomfortable to listen to. And we feel we have to fix it because I see it in my son. He's trying to fix everyone else's problems. And I'm like, stop 
trying to fix other people. It's not for you to fix. Sometimes it's part of our lesson, but it's not your lesson to fix. We have some really deep conversations with Jake and I I just, I love it. I, I find it refreshing to see the world through a Gen Z's kind of eyes, mm. um, being a Gen Xer. It's what I love about life, about humans, about um, growth. One of my biggest realizations in terms of that's who I am. I will never be able to sit still. And it means that I will never be ultimately comfortable, which is why I will continue working. You know, the idea of retirement terrifies me. <laughs> does it? Yeah, it really does. But then that's me. I'm just an unco- uncomfortable sitting still kind of mm. person. What do you think will happen if you stop? Um, I I don't think it would be terribly positive for anyone, <laughs> myself included. Um, I'd probably no. I, why why would want why would anyone want to? Mm. Why? You know how people say, well, you know, on the deathbed, you you'll never say, oh, I sh- wish I'd had more meetings. I'd be like. How do you know that I won't think that? Because actually my my things would be like, I should I wanted to have done more mm-hmm. with business and because that's my purpose. It's a given that I love family and love my friends and but that's who I am. And everyone is different. But then it's assumed that that just makes you a a very odd person. Do you think an odd person or an odd woman? Definitely an odd woman. Um, A very sort of masculine energy. I know that. And it's part of, um, it's part of that shadow, you know? Um, But I've learned to be okay with that. I'm not a feminine, soft person, caring. Absolutely, very compassionate, but I've got very sharp edges in a way. I mean, I'm not a big believer in this whole masculine feminine thing, uh, but I know what you're I know what you're referring to mm. because I recognize myself sometimes and I've had to I remember when we moved to the UK and I you know learned how to speak English and I realized maybe I was a bit as, as a kid like as a teenager and I was quite direct and I had to learn to pick up words like oh lovely so not I had to deliberately do that you to, have to soften myself yeah it's the fillers but it wasn't naturally how I was mm. and and I never used to think there was a huge difference between like men and women obviously physically biologically but in terms of how we are in business or just in general. I didn't think there were that many differences. Mm. So I never really separated myself like, oh, you know, I wouldn't say I'm a masculine woman or a feminine woman. I think I have certain qualities. Yeah. For example, you know, I can be very direct. I learned to soften that. I learned to tone that down because society tells you that's how you're supposed to be. But that is a a feminine and and a masculine sort of, energy this you know the directness is seen as masculine the feminine is is kind of like the but this is what i don't agree with because this is taking a template of a man yeah what makes a man and being direct competitive aggressive you know getting things done yeah and then you take a woman who is you know softer nicer you know a little bit more um compliant I think all these qualities exist in both in both yeah and separating them into masculine and feminine I think yeah. gives a wrong idea and I, I think it's holding mean. both men and women back because then it's not seen as masculine to be soft and compassionate and a good listener and then you're not seen as a proper woman if you are you have leadership skills you're yeah. assertive yeah. you are you know direct you are driven and I think that's not true. Yeah. Because, I mean, I know you. I know lots of women who are like that. I don't see them as less feminine. They're just, that's how they are. That's the skills of a leader. Yeah. It's the skills of a person who gets things done. It's the skills of a person who's good in business. 
that can be a man and that could be a woman. Yeah. Going back to sort of the part of the, our beginning of the conversation in terms of not feeling comfortable with who you are. See, this is kind of who I am. I'm quite an intense person, you know, a bit of a headache for some people. But I love that. I love a, I love a deep conversation. Um, when I'm in France, for instance, Saint Emilion is like a, it's, it's got it's about a thousand years old, and I feel so I feel really comfortable there because I think this this town has been through a thousand years of change and yet it's still standing and it's still beautiful. So my problems are really inconsequential. They don't matter in the grand scheme of things. It helps to put our problems into perspective as well. Mm. Mm. Um, because our problems are very much, many of them, assuming it's not health. Um, they're a problem today. You know, they're not a problem tomorrow. This is the thing about emotions, is that they're not you. Yeah. They're part of you. And there's something that come and go. Yeah. I started tracking my emotions on Notion. So I created this thing called daily check-in. So I have things like, what three things I want to get out of today? What am I grateful for? Size of my waist, because I'm, I'm, I'm monitoring that because it's based on what I'm eating mm. and mood. And the mood I've noticed, I can have almost every emotion in one day, in mm. one single day. And that's fascinating to me. But then the next day might not be as strong. Mm. And the following day might be something else. So they come and go. They come and go. And also things like how much you sleep will have uh, an impact. Um, how much water you drink. If you've exercised. If you're where your hormones are at any one particular sort of day. If you've had too much sugar. If you've had too much carbohydrates. Um, but I love wearable tech. Like I just find it, which is kind of what got me down this sort of health wellness kicker to just hotter. And um, I was wearing, I had one of these gl blood glucose readers. Zoe. No, okay. it was called Very, V-E-R-I. So it mm. was one of the, I had it in about 2020, 2021. Mm. And it was amazing. And mm. I was fascinated by reading the data in terms of how my blood works reacted with things like blueberries or certain chocolates or you know pasta and a good night's sleep or a bad night's sleep and and also reading how my body would change pre-speech and it's just amazing I'm with you on monitoring so I track my sleep religiously I've done the Zoe study which was fascinating mm -hmm. about how different foods impact you and the order yeah. in which you eat them and with exercise it was crazy mm. so you do this test where you you know you eat a bagel in the morning after a fast so you haven't eaten anything for eight hours see what your blood sugar response is the next day you put some you know protein or fat on it and see what the difference is and then the third day you eat the same thing as you ate the first day so say a bagel just a yeah. plain bagel go exercise and see what happens mm. no spike zero spike yeah. It's incredible, which gave you complete validation about, you know, people say, well, if you exercise, you know, it's good. you can see it happening yeah. in real life. But what you're saying about, <laughs> you know, we as beings have all this cocktail of hormones. I don't think anyone is as placed as well to study emotions and hormones as women are, mm. because we go through that on a monthly basis. And when I was talking about my daily check-in, I don't have that in my daily check-in, but I have my calendar is ruled by my menstrual cycle. Yeah. I have, I know exactly when I'm going to be menstruating, mm. maybe like a day or so. I remember you saying this on the, uh, on and the I wasn't going to have message. an interview with you today because it's not one of my good days. It's just after the worst two days. Yeah. So it's it's kind of okay, but I would choose not to. And it's it's changed my view of women. It's changed my view of workplaces. It's changed my own view of myself mm. about where I perform the best. So whilst being on your period, 
if you still have one. You're tired, you need 200 extra calories from what I've learned from Rianne Stevenson, um, who is uh, an expert on supplements nutrition. And I'm not that verbally fluent. Mm. I'm not as bad now as I would have been like a couple of days ago. But I don't want to have pitches during this Mm. time. I want to be more reflective, read a book, Mm. maybe do more contemplative work, maybe even not necessarily strategic, but taking stock of things Mm. as opposed to like being out and being action orientated. And then there is a period in my cycle, which is just before ovulation, when it's literally like a rocket ship, like book me in for like 10 meetings in a day back to back and I will come out and I will be like jumping for joy. Yeah. Like that is the the difference between the different moods and how much of that we don't learn as young women. I mean, I knew about my cycle. I, I haven't actually been taking like a contraceptive pill since like my 20s. So I think that also impacted my ability to read my cycle a little yeah. bit better. Um, and I say impacted in a positive way, but we don't get, we don't get taught no. anything like that. Know, and we crazy, don't hear story. I mean, I think I, I think I learned about this on TikTok. I know. Listen, TikTok is a source. It's a fountain of knowledge. Mm. Totally. And so this lack of data, lack of actual body of work mm. studies to show you as a woman, how you and when you perform at your best. Totally. And then that leads me on to what you're working on mm. now, understanding of the menopause. I mean, from my perspective, I'm just like, blinkers on. Yeah. Don't talk to me about so, it. And why <laughs> would you? Why do you need to think about it any sooner than the moment you have realized you've been going for two years? But the do menopause? you wish you knew sooner? Or do you think that actually, you know what, wait and then deal with it? I I think I would have, and the house would have benefited from understanding why I was so angry and raging. And, and that's a very common thing that I'm hearing when I speak to women. Just bursts of frustration and anger. What you eat has a direct impact on the severity of the symptoms. And if you observe how women going through the stages of menopause in, um, let's say, Japan and China and Korea, how they manage their symptoms versus the West, you'll see a different sort of flex of severity. So in the West, we tend to have a diet that's higher in uh, carbs, sugar, alcohol, etc. And the severity of the symptoms are also higher in in comparison to Japan. It's something that affects half the population. It's not a case of if, but when, because again, not, and there's a lack of education in terms of from a female perspective that, you know, every woman goes through menopause. Sometimes women don't, you know, they, they don't think that every woman does, but you do. It is so bad for some women. It's called the silent killer of women over 40. It has a way of hijacking you mentally. Everyone in a household would benefit with that sort of knowledge and understanding. So if you can yourself see how your hormones and what you're consuming in your lifestyle is impacting your hormones, and if you had that knowledge to also make certain changes, it would be a positive thing for everyone. Mm. There's just a lack of education. Mm -hmm. Um, I try and avoid certain sugars. Obviously, I avoid alcohol for everyone's health and safety. Um, And my symptoms are not as severe. However, if, and I do do the occasional day where I'll, I'll experiment and I'll allow myself a day of having pasta or cookies or whatever, and I will be sitting and I will just feel the sweats coming on the hot flush or the start of a night sweat and yeah you just go yeah well of course you look at what I've eaten today but again it's about understanding yourself and your body and what you need to feel that you can be as productive and effective so with Just Hotter it really is a platform that is really for women 40 plus to be seen like I saw, some, I, I didn't see myself reflected in anything, in any platform 
or sort of visual imagery to describe a menopausal woman oh god <laughs> i mean i'd look at the picture and i'm like she's not even 50 there's she is 70 and not a day young, younger and you're just like are you kidding me and it's like you know no one wants the idea of sex there was an article in france and you know love my my sort of brothers and sisters over there but <laughs> holy cow it's definitely behind the uk in um open-mindedness and um and yeah they've just got no interest in women who you know and certainly not an interest in women and and their sexual um needs or urges yeah well, I, I can understand whereas for a man there's no age there's no age to him he's good he just he just gets better with age a woman oh how do you feel about that? I, yeah, I just, it doesn't, it makes me laugh more than anything. Um, it's, it's changing, but we are, the West is obsessed with youth and beauty. Mm. And it's okay when you're on the right side of youth and beauty. And then of course, you know, when you're on the wrong side of that tipping point, then, you know, you start, there's a French expression, you know, to a rally, which is kind of like complaining. And it's for us to, to change what we want and not accept to be pigeonholed or, you know, told to... Mm. That's like, listen, exit stage left. I know. Uh, yeah. You're over 40, go up on your shelf and be there left forgotten. Yeah. I think this is something that you said about, you know, being being invisible after a certain age. It's almost like, you know, a certain birthday happens and then that's it. Like you're no mm. longer there. And in reverse, when you're young, you're seen as young and incompetent and yeah. you know incapable i can't remember who did the study i think it was a mckinsey or, or harvard or something that was talking about well there, if there is no right age to be a woman you're either too young and incompetent or then you're too old and what did the word you say about when you're uh, I can't remember what you said, but I just have this idea of like this grumpy woman who's just like complaining and yeah. nagging all the time. Yeah. And um, and, and there is nothing in between. I, I kind of don't adhere to joining an echo chamber of talking about how difficult the menopause is without looking at solutions. You know, don't give me to just, just sit and moan about it. Like we know it's shit, but actually there are things that we can do ourselves to improve and it's about understanding what those things are and again being solution orientated it is about creating this pool of information and knowledge and, and products that help you with the root cause of certain symptoms and there will always be the root cause you know the menopause is not one particular thing it's a blend of your hormones and your, it, you know, things are very different one day to the next. It's about understanding, again, much like your Zoe reader, the data points and the actions that trigger the spikes or the actions that make you feel better mm -hmm. and owning it and creating a strong boundary and saying, no, like sleep for me, I go to bed at eight, um, you know, eight o'clock. And it was a big adjustment for the family. What time did you wake up? About five. I loved the early mornings. I used to hate it. But actually, what am I going to do? Watch mindless TV? No. It's funny. You're describing me like rage, feeling that lately. Oh, don't. I'm not. I'm Stop, stopping alcohol because it impacts my moods for three, four, five days yeah. afterwards. I mean, I've gone through various and energy. stages. Um, actually, what's interesting, I'm getting I'm getting more energy now, but that's because I am going to bed on time. Yeah, I'm not watching as much TV as before. Or TV, I don't have a TV, but you know, mm. screen of some kind, and being very mindful about eating. So mm -hmm. you know, doing things like Zoe. Um, yeah. You know, figuring out what's good for your body. I mean, I already kind of knew, but they're just having that, you know, firm 
understanding validation, validation yeah. and seeing that on on a screen and saying look if you eat this this is what will happen rage stopping alcohol we're focusing on food and yeah how do you know when <laughs> it's starting how do you know um so this is the other problem is that dependent on who you go and see you will be told you, you, the response is likely to be, it's more than likely that you are going through the perimenopause. And if you ask for, what well, is there a particular test that can be done? Um, certain doctors will say, well, we can take a blood test, but actually our hormones change day to day anyway. So it's, it's, there is no one particular hormone that will tell you whether or not you are in the menopause. You have 48 symptoms. So, you know, it's essentially you go through the symptoms and if you check off a certain number, then, yeah, could be your, could be. I knew someone, I was talking to someone the other day and she was told by her doctor that she was, she'd gone through the perimenopause and was in the menopause. So, she, you know, and then she went and had some blood works done and she was told actually, no, you know, the menopause just still in peri. So th there's just a lack of consistent information. Um, and there's, you know, people that want HRT and some people who don't and some people don't know. Um, and again, it's just, it's just a self-discovery. So I guess we're the guinea pigs now. We're also yeah. living in AI technology age where we're beginning to track so many things. Yeah. This potentially could be, like we could be the cohort on totally. whom the studies are made yeah. to understand better what happens in the female body and the consequences and how I to cope. Think, I think we also though have a responsibility to take accountability for our own health mm -hmm. and not leave it to someone else to fix further down the line and not feel that we should take any responsibility for the consequences of our choices. And, and I think every stage of life you go through, you know, you can't re keep repeating your behavior and your lifestyle from the 20s to the 30s, to the 40s, to the 50s, because it's impossible, because, you know, our bodies start depleting in certain sort of vitamins. Um, so it's, it's about accountability. So I get really frustrated when people complain about health, you know, certain sort of health and, you know, and certain ailments, but yeah, have no interest in understanding what it's coming down to, because there will be a something that it's, you know, that it's triggering it. So A, not interested in knowing what it is, or B, not interested in making the change to stop, mm -hmm. in which case I'm like, so stop telling me about it, because if you don't care enough to make the change, I, I personally don't care enough to listen. We all have a responsibility to make sure that we look after ourselves. Going back to what you're doing with Just Hotter, mm. you're talking about having like a platform for being heard, being seen. Mm. Talk me through more about what's involved. So we're, we've soft launched mm -hmm. and we're a retail platform, but we also have information through articles on the site um we're looking to record a podcast uh where we bring in doctors or experts in their field ideally i'd love to find a way of using wearable tech data to deliver recommendations in terms of changes to lifestyle and things you could do more i created the business plan which is essentially over three phases so phase one is launch the mvp soft launch and start to take learnings from that which we started to do and it's really interesting so we um we've got we've embedded ai already to the heart of it and so we're starting to really be able to deliver personalized one-to-one -one recommendations via the quiz and things like that i'm blown away by how the pace that ai has allowed us to move in the past 12 months in terms of research, in terms of uh, changes to the site, um, in terms of personalised 
feeds and, and things like that. And then phase two is about bringing community to life. So having an area uh, where it's conversational um, and a space that can be a conversation for asking questions or, or talking about whatever it might be. And then phase three is that actionable data as well. What's your bigger picture with Just Hotter? What do you want it to be? I see this as being a source of information and a source of products that work based on data as well. And what it is today in phase one at this sort of like MVP stage is the start of this um, this new platform. We're unapologetic. For us, it's important to be authentic, to not shy away from those symptoms that make people uncomfortable, um, whilst also finding the funny side of where we are in life and being a place where we see each other reflected in the imagery and in the attitude and the tone of voice because, you know, we're, we're 50, we're still at the peak of our careers. We still, some of us still got a long way to go. We've got kids still at home. We've got parents who are aging. We're starting to feel more aches in the morning. And on top of that, you've got a lovely dollop of crazy hormones that change from one day to the next. It's a joy. Mm. Um, with no real source of information, uh, unless you go really hunting for it. And the majority of women find out that they are going through the perimenopause via chats with friends. And that's just crazy. Mm. Crazy. And it's not, it's not, you know, we could, we can do better than that. It's not good enough. You know, it's outrageous that women have had to put up with this for centuries, millennia. Come on. <laughs> like, you know, we can send people to the moon, but we can't tell you if you're in perimenopause. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good comparison. It's true. I mean, what you said earlier about, well, why would you want to find out before it's time? But I'm beginning to see the benefit of knowing sooner and not putting fingers in your ears and pretending that doesn't exist because that's what we're all doing. Because if you are finding yourself in a place where maybe you're acting out of character mm. or your moods have become much more volatile or more intense. And I think we as women, we tend to think, well, oh, it's just me. We blame ourselves a lot. I I think it's important that we're informed and it's important that we understand what these 48 various symptoms are and they range very broadly. And it's important that we educate ourselves so that we can try and be as friction free once we find ourselves, you know, going through it. But I, you also don't want to worry too much about what is definitely going to come down the track. You want to try and remain present. And being present is something that the, a huge skill of mental control in the face of all the various things that are happening with our life and all this, you know, sort of going back to that conversation we were having before, it's the ability to be present whilst disconnected and or less reactive. God, if you've got those skill sets, you are winning. That is so true. I've just recently finished a book called Playing Big by Tara Moore. I don't know if you've heard of no. her. And I couldn't first get into the book. It was, she was the first kind of part is talking about the inner critic, which I think I'm okay with this whole idea. She doesn't call it imposter syndrome, but this idea that, you know, you have this voice in your head that's telling you you're not good enough. But then she got to the part about the inner mentor, and she has this visualization that she takes you through. And that was crazy. It was connecting with this deep part of you, the part that you just you forget it's there. Mm. Maybe it's intuition. I was going to say, is it like gut instinct, intuition, kind of allowing that, allowing 
allowing yourself to listen to yeah, like gut instinct imp- implies that it's like this instant reaction mm. and i think this is something almost deeper than that it's the stuff you know you need to do mm. and it's the the part of you that is both emotional and intellectual and ex- an experience so it's the part in you that knows exactly what you need to do mm. because you are the expert in you mm. And when I did that visualization, I don't this was only happened like a few days ago and it's 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 mind blowing. It's like literally mind blowing. I still can't, you know, I can't even put it into words. And I think if you I'll I'll link it in the show notes because I think it's so powerful, especially I for women that. to connect with their inner mentor. It's like your, you know, the north star. It's like your mm. true center yeah. of knowing who you are and connecting with it instead of like looking outside and seeing what society telling me, what's yeah. Instagram telling me, what's my boss telling me, what's, you know, my neighbor down the road or whoever. It's it's yes, we listen to it sometimes, but like connecting with that deeper sense of self, of your own knowledge is so powerful. Mm. And I think what you're talking about, you know, going through the menopause, you know, understanding your menstrual cycle. We as women, I mean, I'm not a man. I've not had experience of what it's like, but from anecdotal evidence, like only women really go through the range of emotions in such a short period of time and you are the expert in mm. you. Oh, totally. and connecting with that part i think is just so it's essential it's learning how to listen to your to yourself yeah yeah i completely agree and there's only only you know what is right for you and i think sometimes we bother ourselves with wanting to know what everyone else thinks we should do and why getting so many different opinions and you don't know what to do and then it becomes even more confusing and but actually you know you've got the answer you might not want to list hear the answer or you might maybe you can't hear the answer because there's you know you've got to create a space of calm in order for it to come through how do you want the world to change keeping in mind what just hotter's mission mm-hmm. is centered around menopause like how do you want the world to change to understand maybe the menopause and women better well i think women have got to start with knowing themselves better first of all and we need to start that can only start by being better informed but also knowing ourselves better so listening to our bodies and understanding why what we might be doing and the impact it's having there's got to be a sort of a and there are some really incredible female sort of tech uh leaders who are launching new products focused on understanding like there is no menstrual blood bank for research purposes which is crazy there is no there's been no way of capturing that um and so i was had the pleasure of meeting the founder of um of a business who and that's what she's looking to do and i and these women are they will not accept the status quo and i am there for it i love it it's you know her language is this is unacceptable and i'm like you go girl mm. i'm so proud of you mm. um yeah damn right it's mm. not acceptable but my generation and the generations before and the generations before that have been part of the problem we've brought it to this place where we've not stood up and said this is not acceptable um and we've not been in control so so i feel positive because of the generations you know the millennials um and all their views and determination to not accept status quo and therefore it i'm waving my pom-poms for them and then you've got the gen z going behind and and their approaches to life which is you know just again quite funny i love it i just love change mm 
Well, change we have to get used to as women. So, um, oh yeah, you know, the change maybe not the only which, constant. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, Sarah, thank you so much. Like I can talk to you for hours and hours Details. and I really appreciate you coming on for the second time. I know, thank you very much. And all the best with the business. And um, where can people find the business? So, you? yeah, so justhotter.com or just.hotter if you're in Instagram. Similar names on other social media platforms, but we might not be there yet. So don't go to TikTok, for instance. <laughs> I'd love to see you on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would not be entertaining. That would be more disturbing. Thank, thank you so much, Sarah. Pleasure. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to Anatomy of a Leader podcast. I'm your host, Maria Vorostovsky. If you haven't already, please follow and subscribe this podcast. And I'll see you in the next episode.